Hi everyone, welcome back to this section on the project management body of knowledge, processes. This one in particular is develop the project charter. And as you can see on our beautiful process group and knowledge area mapping table here, pro develop project charter is the very first thing that we will go through um, on our project management journey. Because the way this works, we've got our process groups up the top here, and we've got our knowledge areas along the side. And the way you'll usually see this is it will go from top to bottom, and then to the next one, top to bottom, and then the next one, top to bottom. For example, we're developing the project charter, but we're also identifying the stakeholders, as you can see down the bottom. But then uh, we're developing that project management plan and all of the bits and pieces that will go into that project management plan uh, one by one. And then we're executing the project, so directing and managing the project work, managing that project knowledge, and so on and so forth. So that's how it works. And as you can see, very first one, developing that project charter. So what is developing the project charter? It's the process of developing a document that formally authorizes the existence of a project and it provides the project manager with the authority to apply organizational resources to the project activities. So it really authorizes and initiates that project and it says to whoever you're delivering the project to uh, or the area that you're working in, I can use these resources, okay, yep, you'll help me with this project, you'll perform these activities, and we are together going to um, do these particular things and get the project done. So why do we do a project charter? Well, it provides a direct link between the project and the strategic objectives of the organization. It creates a formal record of the project, it initiates it, and it shows the organizational commitment to the project. So this is a really important first stage. Usually if you don't do this properly, you will run into problems down the track because it really helps with getting, uh, you know, getting everyone on board from the very beginning. So the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs of this particular process. You will see this again across all of the processes that we look at. Each of them will have inputs, tools and techniques that you will use on a regular basis, basis to get it done and then the outputs of that particular process, very important. But first of all, the inputs, we're looking at business documents and the business case, so we'll go into that. Agreements that have been made and the enterprise environmental factors and the organizational process assets, so templates and that sort of thing that we might be using. The tools and techniques as we go along are expert judgment from the people that we need, data gathering to you know, help put it all together, interpersonal and team skills to manage those initial meetings uh, and meetings themselves, of course. And the output is our project charter. And of course, the assumption log. So what assumptions have we made when we've, uh, when we've put this project charter and the business case together? So quickly looking at another map for this one, you can see develop project charter. The inputs are our business documents, our enterprise environmental factors, and our organizational process assets. And the develop project charter uh, process itself goes into many, many, many different processes. So an overview of our project charter or developing our project charter. The project, projects are initiated by an external party to the project. So it's usually not the project manager themselves. Instead, it's a sponsor. So someone who might own that part of an organization or that part of a company or the company itself. It might be the program. So the overarching program that looks after a bunch of projects, for example or it might be a project management office if you're working in a PMO environment. The project charter formally initiates that project and it can be developed by the project sponsor or the project manager in collaboration with the initiating entity. So the project manager can work with those people if that's the right circumstances, depending on the organization that you're working in. The project initiator or the sponsor, whoever's sponsoring this project, should be at a level that is appropriate to procure funding and commit resources to the project. This is very, very, very important. The project sponsor needs to be at that, the right level that they can commit resources themselves. You don't have to go elsewhere. Um, it's, it, otherwise, you know, that will 
definitely be a headache if you have to go elsewhere uh, outside of where the project sponsor is. If they control the area and they control the resources and they can commit funding, then it, you're, you've got it all in the one place and it's much, much easier. It's that, that one person, nice and happy, all you have to do is go to them for the decisions and any changes that need to be made. And you know, as your project goes along, it will be a much easier experience. Lastly, a project charter is not considered a contract. So it's an agreement but it's not a contract because there's no money changing hands. Now, there might be money changing hands if you're getting third parties to come in and do a project, but still you'll have a contract separate to the project charter itself. But that's a key thing for the PMP exam because there's no money exchanged, then it's simply an agreement. It's not a contract. A contract is much more when there's money exchange or changing hands. Let's look at the inputs to develop project charter. We've got the business documents, the business case. This is the uh, used to determine the expected outcomes of the project and justify the required investment. So what is the cost and what is the benefit? This is a business case and in some cases the project manager may be required to work with the sponsor to make this happen and use this as an input for the project charter. But we're looking at things like the market demand, the organizational need, the customer request, has someone specifically requested this change, the technological advances, maybe we absolutely have to to keep up with technology, legal requirements, ecological impacts or social need. All of these things might be associated with the benefits. Uh, but then, of course, we have to look at what the cost is and is it worthwhile to do. We're also looking at agreements as an input into our project charter because someone has to agree to make this project happen. It might take the form of contracts, memorandums of understanding or MOUs, service level agreements, letters of agreement, letters of intent, verbal agreements, emails or other written agreements. And typically a contract is used when a project is being performed for an external customer. Or if you're coming into an organization to do, you know, to separate to that organization, then perhaps a contract will be used if the two parties are separate. Of course, we've got EEFs or enterprise environmental factors. There might be government or industry standards that needed input to the project charter, marketplace conditions, legal requirements, organizational culture or political climate, and organizational government frameworks. So what are the existing templates that we have uh, and or what are the ways of doing business that we need to be careful of when we're creating this project charter? And stakeholders' expectations and risk thresholds. So do they have a high threshold for risk or a low threshold for risk? And we need to take this into consideration when we're doing up the, uh, the solution for our particular business need, hence creating a project. Organizational process assets, also templates, uh, historical information and lessons learned within the organization. So what has happened before, um, particular reporting methods throughout the organization. These are the existing assets in a place that you're doing the project, uh, you know, that you may have to conform to and use in order to create the project charter. Tools and techniques that you'll use for the project charter are expert judgment. You'll need the people in the area that you're going to make the change uh, and their expertise. So, and this might also involve things like the organizational strategy that you're needing to tie the project charter to, any benefits management. So uh, we might need information in that particular area that you're going into on how they measure benefits or what benefits can be managed. Technical knowledge of the industry or the area that you're, go that you're going into as part of the project duration and budget estimation and risk identification. Can these people have the expertise on particular risks that might occur as part of initiating this project? We're going to be using data gathering as part of our tools and techniques. So that might involve brainstorming with, these, with the people initially, doing focus groups or doing interviews. And again, that's to, to gather that information on those risks, on the organizational strategy on the benefits that we might have. You're going to need interpersonal and team skills. There might be conflict management. Anytime there's more than two or three people involved, in fact, even just more than one person involved, there can be conflicting things and conflicting ideas, and that definitely has to be managed as a project manager. You'll need facilitation. 
You'll be presenting or asking people to, or trying to get gather information. So doing workshops and that sort of thing. You'll need meeting management as a skill as well. And meetings themselves held with the key stakeholders to identify those project objectives, the success criteria, the key deliverables, and the high level requirements as part of this initiating document. Now let's look at the outputs of developing the project charter. And as you can expect, the project charter itself is one of the outputs that we're going to have. So it's the document issued by the project sponsor and it formally authorizes the existence of the project and provides the project manager with the authority to apply organizational resources to project activities. Now this document will have the name and authority of the sponsor authorizing the project charter. It will have the assigned project manager and their responsibility and authority level. This can be different depending on the organization that you're working in. The project purpose, the high level description, the key deliverables, the measurable project objectives. So what does success look like for this particular project? High level requirements, uh, approval requirements, who needs to approve what and what is it? Uh, Pre-approved financial resources that will go into this, summary of the milestones that they'll see. So what's being delivered, what features are being delivered, the key stakeholders involved and overall high level project risk at this stage. Of course, we'll delve more into project risk as we go along in our project and there's a specific knowledge area for risk itself. Lastly, the assumption log. So we're making assumptions when we're doing this, this high level document and we just need to know what assumptions have been made. So high level strategic and operational assumptions will have been made. Just put in, uh, in the document you know, what we actually assumed. Lower level activity and task assumptions are usually generated throughout the project. So as we go along, and those will include estimates, schedule, risks, and technical specifications. So the assumption log is used to record all of those assumptions and constraints throughout the project lifecycle. And it just starts at a high level when we're developing the project charter. And those are the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs and a general overview of developing the project charter.